Welcome, Claudia. Thank Thanks you. for joining me on Sunday afternoon. Um, so you. we've been talking for many years off and on about practice. But the idea of practice and the practice of practice, because we have our various practices, the college has a practice. And so I thought today might be a very good opportunity to talk about practice as, um, as it emerges in two of the greatest thinkers that we study on campus, Montaigne, 16th century Frenchman, and Dogen, the 13th century Japanese philosopher, um, both of whom wrote essays, mm -hmm. right? both of whom had their versions of practice for ordinary life, and, um, uh, and, and both of whom raised many questions mm -hmm. about the relation of practice to ordinary life. And it's not, it's not an idea that we get to talk about a lot, or idea that we do talk about in normal life, because most people think they don't have pract a practice, you mm -hmm. know, namely some deliberate mm -hmm. set of activities that they do mm -hmm. with some kind of purpose and mm -hmm. intensity mm -hmm. and consciousness. And so, uh, but it is, a pr well, it is a culture that we have in, uh, say, in martial arts or in uh, yoga, spiritual traditions, in Christian traditions, we have the idea mm -hmm. of practice, mm -hmm. right? But, um, mm -hmm. so I wonder if we could just start with uh, Montaigne and, and uh, and we both landed on this unusual and less well-known essay by Montaigne in book six mm -hmm. called On Practice, yeah. right? which in French is uh, Exercitation, right? Exercises, mm -hmm. ex Exercisation. <laughs> Would you like to introduce us to it? Yes, thank you for pointing me to it. Um, I, I loved this essay. He starts right away uh, by talking about practice in relationship with our awareness of our mortality. So he starts right away by saying, but in dying, which is the greatest work we have to do, practice can give us no assistance at all. A man may by custom fortify himself against pain, shame, necessity, and such like accidents. But as to death, we can experiment it but once and are all apprentices when we come to it. And, and so I really loved how he just like, he just like landed there, which has to do, I think, with our, with the um, in, inevitable emotions that arise when we reflect upon mm -hmm. our, our, the possibility that we would cease to be. Um, but then I, I thought it was really quite amusing that he then goes on um, for quite a number of pages to talk about this possibility that we might actually be able to practice for dying. And I, I also love how that orients the question against the Western mm -hmm. philosophical tradition, because that Socrates, of course, famously says philosophy is a training for death. So we, so he's, he's immediately, he says you can only do it once, so you can't actually have a trial run. But there's a lot you can do to think about um, relationships to mortality. Um, and I'd like to talk about some of those today. I also thought it was quite lovely that he ends the essay with a return to Socrates, who he calls the, I believe, the greatest sage. He's the only sage, right? He's the only one who actually kind of put his money where his mouth was in terms of being willing to stake it all yeah. um, and face death. Um, I, I got quite a lot out of this. And, and I, I'd also like to talk as we go about, he tells personal stories, but he also works in these Latin quotations from various classical Roman mm -hmm. authors. He works in uh, some Dante. So he's He's doing something with the Western literary tradition that seems to have something to do with um, orienting oneself around temporality and mortality. Yeah, yeah, that's part of the tradition he belongs to, right? I'm glad. I'm glad you brought up the the general arc of this essay mm. because it's it's fascinating how he starts. He uh, he starts with the first in the first paragraph with describing how great it is that we can, as he quotes it, exercise and form our soul by experience mm. um, to the way we want it to go, namely a good mm. way of 
this one good way of describing what practice might be, you mm-hmm. know. But then, as you say, immediately in paragraph two, he jumps straight in and says, um, "But for dying, practice cannot help us, right?" And and then he has about seven pages where he unpacks an mm-hmm. anecdote from his life where mm-hmm. uh, one of his servants mm-hmm. riding a big horse mm-hmm. bowls him and his horse over. He's thrown from his horse. He's thrown from his horse. The horse is knocked down too. The horse is knocked down <laughs> on top of him maybe. And so he said this is the only time he's ever lost consciousness. Mm-hmm. Right? And um, mm-hmm. so he then wrestles with that. You know, So mm-hmm. we go into quite some detail about that story. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he comes back mm-hmm. to practice. Well, and he makes it so personal. He says, um, I spend my time working on myself. And then, he, and then he has a critique of what that, why the Western tradition has been so hesitant to allow self to emerge as a kind of crux Mm -hmm. of practice because it's perceived as vanity to focus on self. And so I think he also illustrates something that I hope we can talk about later, which is this is not metaphysics. This is not self as looked upon from the high, lofty, metaphysical heights Mm -hmm. of of a kind of Kantian or Hegelian kind of perspective. This is no, this is my, this is me, and I'm gonna have to face my death with equanimity. Hopefully, he says he's. I love how he's like, hopefully, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you can never quite know. Um, but but he's trying to return us to this po- process of ruminating on what it means to be mortal, what it means to be given one life to live, what it means for things to matter. I think he does a great job with yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. What are you thinking when he says that? I, I guess I'm thinking about a kind of vanity that maybe the metaphysical tradition is not aware of it, of in itself. Mm-hmm. That if if you if you purport to a kind of um, lofty reason, which can somehow sweep away all of our emotional or repetitive responses to things. Then, then maybe there's a kind of vanity in that that you've reduced, you've reduced who you are. And I, I love Montaigne. He's like, I'm, I have all of that. I had a lot of emotion when I woke up, when I regained consciousness after that accident. He talks about his wife, mm-hmm. and and he's kind of invoking kind of this restoration to consciousness. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. I, and I think there is, there is, you know, he says, "Oh, we, we, we've, we've, um, we've turned it into kind of vanity to talk about ourselves, but it's the most important thing we have." Yeah, yeah, and and that leads to me into why I personally practice the martial mm-hmm. arts. You can't get it through daily life, right? Mm-hmm. You can't get it through. Um, am I hungry? I need to get something to eat. You can't get it through the, the sort of u- utilitarian forms of tending to the needs of the body. You have to seek for something that goes beyond utility, mm-hmm. um, something that looks at life from a kind of vantage point of it could throw anything at me, mm-hmm. right? It could, it could bring me great illness. It could take in death the ones I love the most, right? And there's, how do you practice for the, the vicissitudes of, of being embodied, of, of being um, who we are? Mm-hmm. So there's a kind of practice that most people do, usually without knowing it, in everyday life of, as you say, the, the ordinary things, mm. hygiene, mm practice of hygiene, right? practice good health practices, good culinary practice, mm. good social practices. Mm. But, but you're suggesting that it's very different from what Montaigne is describing here, mm. namely a kind of practice that attempts to engage mm. the, the most important moments of everyday life, the most important moments of life mm-hmm. that we can't mm-hmm. necessarily predict, mm. right? The ones that... Yeah. Um, unsettle you completely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and how do we face those moments? Um, we can face them by escaping. 
into distracting thoughts. But, but I think that at the heart of practice is facing those moments with a kind of acceptance, with a kind of fullness of consciousness. And that, I think, maybe bridges the Eastern tradition and the Western tradition. That is it, um, uh, who's, who's the, the Frenchman who talks about how we want to get in our carriage and race off to the country Right, and then we race back to the city. Pascal, mm -hmm. Pascal right? It's right. in the yeah. um, in the Pensee that we, we want to race around and distract ourselves so that we don't have to feel the full weight. I think this notion of practice has something to do with looking straight at it without flinching, and it's and it does take. I mean, I'm thinking of my martial arts practice. I, I do, as you know, I do the Japanese mm -hmm. uh, martial art of Aikido. I have a, a fifth degree black belt. Right. It's been a long journey. 30 years, right? It's a been long, 30 yeah. years, yeah. a long journey of, of hitting the mat hard in the cold of winter and sweating hard in the heat of summer. And you, you have to keep asking yourself, why, why would I go back to the dojo? Why would I continue to go back? Mm -hmm. Why would I put myself in the throes of discomfort when I could not. I could mm. turn on the air conditioning and out order the um, fish tacos. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but we, we begin to undo, I think, the inevitability of utilitarian thinking. We begin to unearth mm -hmm. a more um, raw willingness to contemplate pain and uh -huh. discomfort. So I wonder if, before we go further into this, could you describe for the viewers who might not know what exactly Aikido is, how it differs from the others, and what mm. goes on in the dojo? So when you say you go there mm. for the discomfort, what, what do you mean by that? Mm. Yeah. yeah, so we walk into the dojo and you, you have to bow uh, to the kamiza, to the sacred shrine, uh, mm. the Japanese notion of the sacred shrine. And you're in your uniform. Not yet. Oh, not yet. Okay. Not yet. But there's this kind of liminal, and I wanted to talk about this today, yes, this please, notion yeah. of liminal spaces. Yes. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. You walk across the threshold, mm -hmm. and the cares of the day, all of the thinking that you've done at St. John's College, right, where you've been like teaching Kant and you've been talking about Aristotle, all of the cares of the day, you have to realize I left those on the shoe rack when I took off my shoes, and I crossed into the dojo and I did my bow. And I've entered into, I think, what we would call a s sacred space, a space that has been carved out of daily life where something else is going to happen. And I think mm. one thing I like about the Japanese martial art of Aikido is that what, what it, it's up to you to discover what that something else is. So Aikido was... Um, it was, it's the most recent of the Japanese martial arts. It was invented in um, Japan after World War II by um, Morhei Ueshiba, who very uh, consciously felt that humanity needed to address its violence problem. And so he came up with this idea that you could design a martial art around the concept of love, around the concepts of I, uh, AI is mm -hmm. the Japanese syllable for a kind of, maybe agape would be a commensurate. Yeah, yeah. yeah in Chinese too, I is love. Love, yeah. and then ki, which is the energy, mm -hmm. the energy that flows through us, the energy of the universe. And, and so with Aikido, it's, um, it's pretty unique among the martial arts in that right. you can practice it at full power without anybody getting mm -hmm. hurt. And, and Do is, is Tao. Do the is way. the way, So it's like the, the, path. the way of loving energy or the mm -hmm. way of love and energy. Yeah, yeah, and for me, Do is, do is just that you go in and practice uh -huh. wondering what the path is. And some days it's like, I hate this. I'm going to quit at the, end of the, at the end of the session. I'm going to go to Sensei and tell him I quit. And some days it's unbelievable recognition that there's um, a, an interface of consciousness that you don't encounter in daily life. Mm -hmm. So that's when you you bow, right at the beginning. So so the liminal space. Yeah, that I always yeah. taught mm -hmm. I, the way I understood it in my practice is that it's it's similar. You you bow mm -hmm. all the preoccupations of daily life, your frustrations, your sadness, your anger drop off your shoulders. Or they should. Or they should. They should. That's what you're trying to do. So you can go in there clean, 
because you're going to practice some mm. dangerous stuff, mm -hmm. right? And you don't mm. want any of that stuff to fuzz you up or right. interfere. Right. And right. at the end, you bow all of what you've just been practiced mm. of. Yeah, mm -hmm. can I tell you a story actually? Because yes. we do Iaido as well yes. as a dojo, mm -hmm. the art of the sword. And I, um, we started up again after the pandemic a year ago. It was in April of 2021. Mm -hmm. And I, I have this little lightweight practice sword. It doesn't even have a sharp edge. And I started with that. And the very first time I drew it out of the tie, out of the scabbard, I, I hurt my elbow. Mm -hmm. And it was like this constant wrestling. Like, am I really going to do this again at this stage in my life? Um, and I finally worked myself up. Um, I have a, a live sword, um, a Japanese blade, very sharp, very heavy. I finally worked myself up. I'll take it to the dojo. Ten minutes. I take the other one, too. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, I'm going to cash it in. I traded them out. And, it, and, it, and then 20 minutes, 30 minutes, slowly developing the, the strength to be able to practice because it's very heavy on the right elbow and the right shoulder. Um, but I realized that I was in an antagonistic relationship with this sword. I, I saw it as an adversary. It, it was something I had to wrestle with. <laughs> and if I could do it for 20 minutes, it was a victory. And I finally realized it's the adversarial <laughs> that's my enemy. Mm -hmm. So I, I sat down with the sword. I bowed to the sword. And I, I said out loud, I said, I respect you. And I bowed to the sword. And everything changed that day. Mm -hmm. And now I take out that sword every Saturday. I take it out. I bow to the sword. I say, I respect you. You are a worthy warrior. Mm -hmm. So you're not entering clenched and embattled and... Oh, it, yeah, self sabotaging. I, yeah, I yeah. saw it as an yeah. adversary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so then what? So you go into so you go into the dojo, and then what happens? What happens in Aikido? Oh, well, who knows? I mean, it's different every day. I mean, some days you're running a tape in your mind from something you're clinging on to from your work, from your personal life, and you never get past that. You're just running the tape the whole time that you're practicing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And sometimes some amazing thing happens where you can drop all of that and have an insight or I mean, we can talk about this later, but just the now. Mm -hmm. What is the now? Mm -hmm. And how does the now work? Uh -huh. but, in, but in the dojo, on, on, to, to an observer, it looks as if there's a series of mm. simulated attacks where mm -hmm. one person attacks and, and, right. and, and is then thrown right. to the ground or taken into a joint lock. Right. Or something like that. Right. right. There are yeah. the techniques. And then, yeah. and then because Aikido focuses so much on love, we spend a lot of time thinking about the art of ukemi. Mm -hmm. Ukemi being the art of being able to fall to the mat safely without injury. Mm -hmm. So, we even, so even, even receiving the technique in Aikido is a practice. In, in some ways, more interesting. More interesting. Yeah. Um, the technique is the technique. I mean, obviously, there are technical aspects to it. And we need to think about, is it, you know, are you trying to raise the chin? Are you trying to cut across mm. the eyes? What are you trying actually to do with, with the strike or with the, with the movement? But in, in receiving the technique, it, it's very, um, it, there, you really can't be distracted. <laughs> because you're gonna hit the mat and you're probably gonna hit it pretty hard. And there's only yeah. kind of a few ways that that could happen without injury. So I, I, I think that's, that's nice. what drew me to Aikido was the art of ukemi, the art of yeah. taking the fall. And that mm -hmm. I think relates to what we said about life. Life is gonna throw a lot of attacks at you. Can you take the fall? Yeah, uh, somebody uh, with whom I trained judo, uh, a long time ago, told me about ukemi. So if I'm receiving the fall in a test, fall in such a way as to make your friend look really good. Mm, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's beautiful. A, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and I think a lot of people come into the dojo and watch, and at the end of, of, of the watch, they're like, it doesn't look all that hard. And, and you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's the perfect response. Yeah. <laughs> you just made me feel really good. Yeah. <laughs> So, so just to go back to Montaigne, now you're helping me see something. So there's a, this, this whole essay is built on a fall, mm. right? Mm. And, and it's mm. in a way the whole essay is about ukemi mm. right. in, in a deep way. Right. Um, and I can't help thinking about what you said 
concerning the Socratic tradition early on, that Socrates is the one who first mm. made the injunction that to philosophize is, is to learn how to die mm. or, to, or to study how to die or mm. to practice how to die, right? And Montaigne himself is an essay in book one mm. on, on that very theme, to, to, mm. uh, mm -hmm. to philosophize is to learn how to die. Mm. And in that tradition, the, the work or the practice is mainly cerebral, mm. right? You're trying to understand death. Mm. You're trying to uh, see how your soul is not the same as your body. Mm. You're trying to wean your soul away mm. from the body, from this world of flux, by philosophizing, by thinking through what it might be. So, so the practice, mm. at least in, in Plato's Phaedo, and, um, mm. and to some extent with Montaigne, you know, it's early on in Montaigne, is to, um, mm. it, is to face death constantly in your mind so that it's not alien to you. It's like you're making the sword your friend, mm. right, in a way. So, so, but, but you do it with, a, at least with, with Socrates and Montaigne and the Stoics, for sure. You're, making, you're befriending it, um, making it your benefactor, mm -hmm. you know, as it were. But here, mm -hmm. there's a kind of turn, you know. So when he says that death is something you can't practice for, mm -hmm. it's as if he says that way of practice, the, the, the cer cerebral thinking, the ordinary thinking that isn't, mm -hmm. that, that isn't faced with something physical, right, right is, is not really practicing for death because death, when it comes, is going to be uh, unexpected, right. uh, unpredictable, mm -hmm. and physical, right. right? It's going to be a fall right. in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's... Right, and I, and I think that's kind of why I brought up that as this notion of the essay, mm -hmm. uh, what is that literally is like an attempt, an right? Attempt, yeah. Right, that this is not metaphysics. This is not retreating into thought constructs. Um, I think that's very important because I'm not convinced that death should come to mind, right? Levinas has that whole essay on whether God should come to mind. No, God should come to heart. And I think death also should come yeah. to heart. And, and this kind of response to it, I think, does justice to that turn from, well, let me, let me engage in, in reason, let me um, engage in syllogistic reason, right? Kind of mm -hmm. does this sort of self-consistent reason and, and just allows himself to wander into those places of f fear, of weakness, of feeling that. The f he, I love how he describes just like waking up like a broken body, right? When he comes yeah. back after the, after the, um, after the fall off the horse, he's, he wakes up, he comes back to consciousness, but he's a broken body. And he, and he begins to start to process uh, our brokenness. And, and that, that appeals, I think, at a, at a practice level of, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he says he can't even, he wouldn't have remembered what happened if it were not for the onlookers. Mm -hmm. Right, right? And we can all yeah. relate to that experience of yeah. like kind of being knocked unconscious and being confused and um, his wife and his the people who witnessed it they kind of tell him yeah what what do you make of that i guess that aspect of being having to be told yeah what what happened to you yeah uh, because what because what we what we're reading then in this story is not even Montaigne's memory of it it's 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 a reconstruction a kind of like a composite memory oh yeah and, reaching and it, into the collective yeah reaching yeah. into the collective which he yeah. then reimagines and writes down right so mm. so there's a funny way in which this fall that the blank in memory mm. the, the loss of consciousness right is mm. is is mm. itself a kind of death right for mm. for a moment there's a there's a blank in my existence mm. and I need the help of all these people to piece it together mm. and yes. you, you know so, so this this just emphasizes what what you said earlier, and that the the metaphysical tendency is really to pretend that there's some spot outside oh. change or so outside experience mm. that that you can stand on mm. and and where you don't change and it doesn't change, and yes. you can look down objectively and everything that's happening, and that it's always there. Mm. And that that's the kind of pretense because we don't we can't in fact find it, mm. you know. And and so this this mm. fall from the horse is a. Uh, um, Mm. is really for kind of temporarily the loss of his existence. Mm. That giving oneself over to the, 
to the importance of the congregation. I'm thinking now of religious. I'm thinking now not of mm -hmm. Montaigne and not yet of Eastern, Eastern mm -hmm. practices, but of maybe things from the Judeo-Christian tradition or are the Muslims are about to go into Ramadan, um, this period where you give yourself over to hunger and thirst during the day in order, and then not in order, but then going to feast with the community at night. And, and just having read Genesis in sophomore seminar earlier this year, um, this, this notion that one doesn't know where the meal is going to come from. One has mm -hmm. to give oneself over to this kind of faith mm -hmm. that God will provide and there will be a meal um, but it, but this, this is very foreign, I think, to us at this stage in our kind of utilitarian socioeconomic ethic where we, we provide food for ourselves and our families and we think about ourselves as people who, mm -hmm. um, as people who, if we're successful, right, we're always able to, to get the food on the table. Um, a lot of religious practice, I think, gives itself over to this idea, no, you, you hurl yourself into the collective and you, you, ha you trust, you have faith that if you can't do it, someone else will. This is very much at the heart of the Judeo-Christian ethic. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, yeah, it's definitely different. Yeah. When you, yeah. In East Asian ethic too, I'm thinking Confucian mm -hmm. ethics, mm -hmm. you know, where uh, every ritual in ordinary life, you know, a handshaking, sitting at the table, mm. having mores of how we oh, yeah. talk, how we eat, mm. uh, how we love, how we rule, mm. how we die, mm. how we celebrate death. You know, all every single step mm. is is ritualized in a way where mm. it's a wholehearted hurling of yourself, as you put it, into mm. the whole social order. Um, and not a withholding, right? Whereas, whereas for us, we tend to think about it as, as being, um, as social mores, as being like a, a softening of interactions between individuals, mm -hmm. you know, a kind of mm -hmm. uh, mediation between individuals, but, but not something that has the power to transform yeah. the individual. Yeah, and, and the, tr the, the trust, the trust that the ritual will enact whatever spiritual work is evoked in mm -hmm. grief or in fasting or yeah. in um, um, this kind of Christ, the Christian ethic of kind of radical love of neighbor. Um, the trust, right, that if, that we don't have to do it ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. That, that there, there are these um, more collective mechanisms. Yeah, I think the dojo really reflects that. I mean, we call each other, um, if, if someone's of lower rank, you, you call them San. So mm -hmm. I would say Krishnan, but you're, well, you're probably senior to me. So I would call you Senpai. So I would say Krishnan Senpai. But if someone's slightly lower, I would just call them San. But those kinds of mechanisms of organizing our collective life relative to these notions of you're an elder. Maybe you're an elder. You've been on the path longer than I have. Mm -hmm. I have something to learn from you. Or you're my junior. I have to really try to embody my responsibility of trying to make sure you see the right things in the practice. Um, you know, those kinds of things, I think, are, are very much present in the martial arts. This, you know, or, or sitting in the Zazen monastery right where we wouldn't even use our names mm -hmm. right we would we would just kind of move toward a kind of place of um be just just a place right and that i think kind of dogan brings that up that um i hope we can talk about that that kind of letting letting go of i have to do it for myself or yeah. i'm i have i have to be Strong, strong enough. Yeah, yeah. And with, with Montaigne too, you see in this essay where he's, uh, he's bowled over by someone else and by someone, he falls off his horse and then he's put together uh -huh. by other people, right, right? right? They carry him back. They put him together. They take care of him. They mm -hmm. even restore his memory. That's they, right. They give him, they tell him what's happening. You know, so in a way, the, mm -hmm. the entire community he, mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. is him mm -hmm. right now. And, and perhaps all mm -hmm. those quotations of Latin authors mm -hmm. uh, think it's, 
Mm -hmm. They're him. He's them. He's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not just, it's not just my physical community of those that yeah. live with me. It's also this notion that my community is the human tradition yeah. that I have come into and I will depart from. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love how he crosses time, right? He's yes. like, I'm just going to reach back a thousand years and like yeah. <laughs> connect with yeah. that. Thing. Yeah, and then there's, yeah. No, there's no way he can draw a line between what's him and what's everything else. Well, right? and, and that yeah. I think, that brings us to what we do at St. John's. Yeah. We reach across time, right? We think of these works as, as timeless, in, not in the sense that they are always um, reflective of the utilitarian mores of the day, but in the sense that they're worth reading from this point of, of view of cultivating our humanity. And, and that, I think, is a practice of just taking one of the books and opening it and reading it with a spirit of inquisitiveness or curiosity. Um, but also we come together and sit together for long periods of time, mm -hmm. just doing nothing but having a conversation, right? We haven't, we haven't scripted it in advance. And so it takes on a kind of improvisational character and why, like, why are we doing that? Like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have to sit for two hours. Well, at at certain time, yeah. we do this at a certain time. We have to sit for two hours. We have to start with an opening question. Yeah, yeah no, I think St. John's College Seminar. There's a really funny thing about it being two hours because I think one comes and one gets tired very quickly because it goes late into the night, and one's like, oh yeah, you could just like knock it. You could knock out that conversation in an hour. We could, we could get all that done in an hour. We don't need, but it has to take two hours. There has to be that moment when everybody's sort of sitting there thinking, oh, I wish we were done, but we have a whole other hour. And then you sort of relax into that space and something magical happens in the second hour. And that's what we're talking about with the martial arts. That's what we're talking about with this notion of essay writing. Like where, where, is, where are you gonna go, right? Like what, what paragraph are you gonna write next or what, what whimsical, um, Thing are you going to find in the in the classical tradition that you that maybe kind of gives you a mm, mooring point, a foundational point? Mm -hmm. yeah. You, yeah, you kind of have to, and that's throwing yourself into the collective. Yeah. You know, like okay, there's 20 other people in this room. I have to sit here. I have to let it let them think their thoughts too. I wonder if we could just go back to this question about um, the physical practice, mm -hmm. the importance of the physical, mm -hmm. because this is like, radically different from the platonic practice of mm -hmm. thinking, mm -hmm. right? You think, you know, you, you affect the relationship to death by thinking through mm -hmm. it. And what I think we're, mm -hmm. we're saying that Montaigne and Dogen and others and, and the dojo are all suggesting is that there's something very important in the body feeling this, you know, you actually have to be slammed to the mat, mm -hmm. right? And, and so can, can you say more about that? How, how did that affect you? What, what would be missing if you didn't have mm -hmm. this practice, Aikido, in your life? Well, I, I turned to Aikido while I was in graduate school because I felt that I was becoming a brain on a stick. I had actually had thoughts of stepping in front of the bus, mm -hmm. you know, like this, this was very... Um, divided life. We are bodies in motion, mm -hmm. right? That is what we are. Yeah. We move. Um, even if we are not actively mm -hmm. cultivating a life of motion, which I, you know, I, wouldn't, I don't presume to judge, but we are bodies in motion. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, for me, that was very restorative, I guess, just getting to a place of seeing mind and body could actually go together. Aikido is interesting, yeah. right? It gives you a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. You're like, hmm, what do we... But at the same time, you have to... Um, the mind alone cannot solve its problems. There mm -hmm. has to be... So, so you, you learn how to put those two things together. Being a body in motion is... I mean, I think of Montaigne saying, dying is the greatest work we have to do. Right? right? That there's... That we're going to arrive at this threshold and uh, and how do how could we possibly practice yeah. for, for that if not to become aware of all of the thresholds that we cross every day as we move through the home out out of the home into the workplace 
into the um, place of the, the, the stores and the things that will supply our daily needs. Those are all thresholds mm -hmm. that we have to cross. Um, I, I do think we spend a lot of time maybe trying to distract ourselves <laughs> from thresholding yeah. as a kind of practice. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think so too. I mean, I find that in myself, I, I tend to be an over-imaginative person. <laughs> you know, I, I live in my head, in, in my stories, soul a yeah. lot. Yeah, I live in stories, yeah. I live in images. Yeah. So um, martial arts practice and the practice of sitting mm -hmm. was uh, really important to bring mm -hmm. me back to my present, you know, and what was around me. Mm -hmm. Mont Montaigne himself kind of has his version of, of sitting as, as a metaphor, because he keeps saying throughout his essays, mm -hmm. I'm thinking in, on experience, how, um, how we are a whole that is made up of a body, of motion, of mind, mm -hmm. of emotions, of thoughts. We're not just mm -hmm. one of these that we can abstract from mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so the question is that we don't always, I think you're pointing, we don't always live as if we're this whole, mm. right? And, and when we don't live mm. like we're this whole, if we're, if we're just one part of it, mm. if we're just the physical, if we're just the sensual, if we're just the mm. sexual, if we're just the mm. intellectual, we get unhappy. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of practice for me is about undoing residue. Mm -hmm. Right, residue builds up. Right, um, residue, right. emotional residue. Um, if you work at St. John's, you get a lot of residue, or you're still thinking about a conversation or um, intellectual residue. Um, just mm, the chatter of the mind, and I, I think for me, practice is very much about breathing through the residue and getting getting. I don't know what you get to. I mean, I, I guess I. W I still don't know what you get to, but at least you get to a moment where you realize, oh, like that's just a layer of residue. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Like that doesn't yeah. have to be definitive of yeah. self. Um, that's yeah. that's just a hangover of something that happened to me yesterday. Um, yeah, I mean, it's some kind of threshold. You're saying some kind of threshold that's holding us back, you know, whatever this residue is. Yeah, like we're bouncing off yeah, of Yeah, bouncing off. And yeah. it could be boredom is the most common one, mm. right? Or mm. the need for distraction, distraction, the need for stimulation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so mm -hmm. just just being forced in a practice mm -hmm. to to sit there and go through with it. You know, being able to sit in a seminar for two hours and listen to the talk for two hours, mm -hmm. you know, th it's really important. You might start to lose interest in an hour, but you have to sit through it. Mm -hmm. Sitting in meditation. You might start to lose interest in about mm. five minutes, mm -hmm. uh, and oh. you'll and you'll come up with all kinds of excuses mm -hmm. like my leg is starting to hurt, my you know I need to change positions. But mm -hmm. if you just sit through it, you find that you go past your threshold mm -hmm. in a way that mm -hmm. the practice takes you past the threshold, right? If mm -hmm. if you stick to the practice. Yeah, and being in a body, it bodies hurt. Yeah. What are you going to do with that? Bodies hurt, and if you're going to get older, which hopefully we are, you know, you're going to have to look right at a lot of physical discomfort that you can't medicate your way through. Uh, what are you going to do with that? Our sensei, our sensei, our, our Aikido sensei, um, he says young lions, right? Like that they come to the dojo at young. They're like the young lions. They They hurl themselves as if they're launching it all into the conquest. But you get older and you learn to practice in a different way. Um, you learn to practice in a way that acknowledges that you're not a young lion anymore. You can't stake it all on any one showdown. You have to, you're stiff, your hips are stiff, your knees are stiff, but you still wanna practice. So I think that that notion of aging is is definitely here in Montaigne. He he spends a lot of time in the essays talking about yeah. aging, right? Yeah, like well, um, ten pages in on experience about his kidney stones. <laughs> kidney stones, right? And and so you ask like, what does what do kidney stones have to do with anything? And, and you're saying, well, kidney stones have to do with everything. They have because to do with kidneys, pain. They have yeah. to do with pain. They have to do with being in a body. Mm -hmm. Now I'm seeing the the initial statement differently. To philosophize is to learn how to die. It's we see that includes learning how to age. Mm -hmm. That includes learning how to be in a body, mm -hmm. how to be in time, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. how to have senses. Yeah, I, I wonder if one of the things we get from that is, um, ju one of the things that pain teaches us, discomfort teaches us, is our limits, mm -hmm. right? You know, so the whole young lion mindset mm -hmm. is, is that we have no limits. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Same when we read, same in our imagination. In our imagination, we have no limits. Mm -hmm. 
But there's something very important about running up against something that hurts. Mm. Yeah, and I wonder if there's something organic too about the young lions sort of metamorphos- metamorphizing into um, more humble older age. Maybe that's really organic too. Maybe there's a way we have to start as young lions and then um, morph into Mm -hmm. the humility of illness and Mm -hmm. pain. Um, And and that could get back to the thing about the elders, right? That you, you look, what do you see when you look at your elders? You see those who are walking the path, right? Mm-hmm. To show you where the, to show you where your future might 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 go, um, and the Japanese martial arts are very cognizant of those who are ahead of you on the path, and those who are behind you on the path, and you you have obligations in both directions mm-hmm. to the young um, and to the old. Yeah, and when you look ahead to the old, you see they've suffered. Right, they've they've been cut down to size. They've and they lost have, people they love. Mm-hmm. They've been in pain. They and are in pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and they have something profound <laughs> to teach you if you only knew what question to ask. You know, and and I, I have a, a friend um, from my church. She's she's ninety two. She's about to turn ninety three. We have coffee every Friday, and she's really remarkable in that she can give narrative to her experience mm-hmm. with getting old. She just recently had to surrender her car keys um, because she's had these blackout episodes. And, and she, she's talked a lot with me about kind of really wanting to approach that moment with consciousness, consciousness and mindfulness, that she wants to be graceful about it. She's seen a lot of her age mates resist the moment they had to, to stop driving. Oh, I, you know, they would just, find these sneaky ways around and get the car keys from their daughter or whatever and go off. And, and she's like, no, I really want to be purposeful about this moment of surrender. This was like befriending your sword. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want an adversarial relationship yeah. with this. Yeah. Especially with your own life, right? You mm. don't, yeah. Could we talk briefly about Dogen? Yes. Yeah, so here we have, uh, so we have a 16th century, mm. uh, we've, we've just been talking about 16th century French writer. And... So now we're talking about a 13th century mm. Japanese writer. He's a writer. Mm. He's, he's about um, as most powerful writer as, and as beautiful a writer as you could imagine. Mm. He wrote essays, mm. sometimes called fascicles, but they're mm. essays. Mm. Right? And, and uh, they might, some of them are personal, mm-hmm. some of them are less personal. Mm-hmm. Um, so a 13th century Zen monk mm. who was the abbot became the abbot of his monastery. He went to China, he studied Mm. various languages, he came back to Japan and um, revitalized Zen, right? And at the heart of his practice is sitting Mm. Zazen, Mm -hmm. right? Zazen being Zen meditation, Mm -hmm. but he's sitting. Mm -hmm. I wonder how does this, the the practice of sitting, like we practice sitting in seminar, you know, so that's, Mm. we sit there too, but the sitting, how does that relate to say the practice of falling, both to say in Aikido and in Mm. Montaigne? Mm -hmm. Well, I think Dogen, for me, Dogen really is able to illustrate the vessel of consciousness. And I, He's very clear that he wants to restore the practices of Zen Buddhism to this kind of really mindful presencing of consciousness. And and no one else can do this, like Dogen can do this, right? He he can just get you thinking about what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. I'm a thinking vessel. What's going on with that? Um, now he's different though, though, because he, um, he definitely recognizes self. He recognizes the discreteness, the uniqueness of being an individual consciousness. It's your work. No one can do it for you, right? You, you have one consciousness in, in your, in your care for you to shepherd through life. And what you do with that is, is your responsibility. He's very aware of self. But he doesn't 
make certain assumptions that I think 16th century French kind of expected Montaigne to make, which is a notion of a kind of soul body split. So, so Dogen is able to really look at the whole package. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about, right, as I sit in Zazen is my knee hurts, right? Already there, you have this unity. <laughs> okay, I'm thinking. But the narrative that just flashed through my mind has to do with my knee. Mm -hmm. So there must be some kind of, um, kind of unity that's available to the consciousness doing its thinking thing and the body. Um, and I, I think Dogen is really delightful that way, that he restores us to a unity. Montaigne is, does it quite a bit. But Montaigne, I think, is maybe forced into certain um, kind of maybe connotations that take their backdrop against a certain type of religious assumptions that you, that you yeah. kind of have to speak of the soul and the body as if they're yeah. two different things. Yeah, and it might be how he talks rather than what he thinks, mm. right? Because, but I think you're right. Is, yeah, is yeah. that is that yeah. this this assumption that though the framework that he's working on of mm. soul mm. and body uh, that I think he has to speak within, right? He can't he if he were a heretic and went mm -hmm. yes. and, and went against it, Can't I mean, in the late 16th heretic. century, it would be terrible right. for him, right? But but so that but but it's this it's this assumption of soul and body mm. that leads to metaphysics. Mm. We the sense that there's some some mm. timeless spot that the soul belongs to where it can spectate mm. over everything bodily. Mm. But um, but in a way, I don't think Montaigne really believes that. I think he really mm. believes that we're we're, we're in there mm. entirely, and like Dogen is in there entirely. Mm. There's no, there's no mm. outside spot that you can see, right? The mind is watching, but the mind is always changing. Mm -hmm. The mind is influenced by the body. The mm. mind is not something separate from the body. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, there's a kind of, I think maybe this is a version of Ukemi too, yeah. is a receptivity mm -hmm. to not being separate. Yeah, what are you yeah. gonna what are you gonna do with the consciousness that's been entrusted to you? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and he yeah, and I like how Dogen can both he starts this little volume, the heart of Dogen's Shobugenzo volume that that we have, he starts it with the physical practice of taking your seat on the cushion, of adopting the lotus position, um, orienting your um, your hands toward the body center, the um, mm -hmm. toward the kind of high abdomen. He's very visceral about like, well, yeah, you're gonna put your butt on a cushion and you're gonna sit up straight and you're gonna fold your hands in a certain way. And um, but then he slowly, as as the as the essays go forward, he slowly begins to open up these questions of time is passing, mm -hmm. right? Time is passing. This is a deep metaphysical problem that everybody worries about, right? Aristotle. Yeah, everybody worries about time. Uh, Heidegger, <laughs> you know, and he's like, time is passing, and and he comes up with this really unique um, idea. I think that you could you could ride the wave of time, right? So so this notion that you have brought up several times that you could adopt this kind of God's eye view in which you could lock the world down, that is a kind of conceit of the metaphysical tradition. I think Dogen kind of manages to accomplish the. I think one aspect of the God's eye view that never kind of gets knocked down in the West. Until Nietzsche. It, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> until Nietzsche, yeah. is this idea that you could somehow take these little timeouts from time, yeah, right? right? And you could mm -hmm. do your thinking in, in a little timeout and then come back and yeah. be like, this is what I came up with, you know? Um, and yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, Dogen has this quality where he's like, you, you don't get timeouts. Um, even the thinking you do, where you're like, let me walk off into my room and, and see what I come up with. I'll come back and tell you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. He's like, even that is is just such a illusion. Yeah, and it, and it's, there, there's where Dogen and Montaigne both have this effect of a reset, right? When you, a, a, a returning you to sanity in some ways is that you don't, mm. you're now receptive to what is. You're in your life. You you get to see what's in front of you. You get to see what's in you, mm -hmm. and you start from there. Not not. You know, so you start from what's actually there, mm -hmm. not not what is not some fictional point of view that is uh, that you don't really have. Yeah, it's right. like what we were saying about the thresholds. Yeah, um, you could be walking out to your car after work when some terrible accident occurs. You know, and and I think we that's part of practice is yeah. that walking out to your car is just 
is just as critical a moment in your human <laughs> being <laughs> as whatever important task you just yeah. accomplished in your in your work life or you don't get timeouts. That's I think that's the message I get from Dogen is you don't get timeouts because death or catastrophe could come for you at any moment. Are you looking at it? Are you are you able to face it? Right, right. So you get you get one time out. Well, but that's the one you don't want. Right? That's, that's that's the, the greatest work yeah. you have to do. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so, yeah, that's right. So I wonder if just uh, as our time is coming to a close, I wonder if you could pull back and just think about very briefly whether you think that in a liberal education, in an education that's built on books and thinking and talk, mm. whether there is serious need for mm. a practice or whether there's something lacking about education if there isn't the, the aspect of practice? Well, I think in my personal life, it's absolutely been the only thing that saved me. Um, and I think the reason, I, the reason there is that, again, this notion of residue, <laughs> Um, if, if you live strictly in the intellectual world, a lot of personal, uh, there's a lot of unfinished business, right? There's thoughts that are left unthought. There are people who you didn't fully understand. There are people maybe that you disagreed with but could never fully reconcile. So there's all this unfinished business from a from an intellectual point of view. Mm -hmm. Anxieties, guilt. Anxieties, yeah. guilt, um, trying to achieve a kind of work-life balance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of that, it, it, it builds up a lot of residue. And I do think that practice centers around breathing. Mm -hmm. So when I go to the dojo on Saturdays, after a week up here, I'm like buzzing with unfinished business. It takes me the whole morning to be like, breathe in, breathe out. That was one. Breathe in, breathe out. That was two. And it's so restorative. It's, it's like, okay, I can, I can clean the, I can clear the, the slate ready for another week. Um, and I do think, you know, a liberal, you say liberal arts, liberal is supposed to be what frees us, right? It's liberating. Mm. What is it freeing us from? If not, well, we, we say in this liberal arts community, the unexamined life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, we want to examine our preconceptions. I have prejudices. I want to examine those. I want to find out whether they are grounded in real, real reality or whether they're just fluff that I inherited from, without, you know, thoughtlessly inherited. But also liberating ourselves should be from the way we get trapped in our own trains of thought. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on this train. I got on the A train, right? I, like I'm going, <laughs> I'm right. going down this, this train railway and no, I want to be able to get off the A train. I want to be able to say that's the A train. But thinking itself sets up patterns that we need to liberate ourselves from. Right, because if we're, li if we're living in thought patterns, then we can't see clearly. We're not right. living yeah. in our mind-body yeah. unity. We're yeah. not living in that my child has a need right in front of me or... Um, or living in the full experience of our kidney stones or whatever. Right. Or being thrown from a horse. Or being thrown right, from a horse. Right, being where the horse itself is thrown. You know, it's something so vigorous that mm. it jolts us. Yeah. yeah, and I think what you said too about being able to see the ways that we are uh, dependent upon the collective. Um, I'm not so sure that thinking liberally always takes us down that path. Mm. Sometimes I think it can give us the illusion that we're mm. we're on our way toward the right answer. Yeah. And that that might be the closest thing to practice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. You gave me a lot to talk about. Oh my to gosh. think about anyway. And thank so, you so much. it's a nice place to to end. Yeah. I appreciate thank you. it. Yeah.